lot of countries in the global south um, expect a lot from the EU, but the EU has to be also humble because the challenges uh, are so huge that, of course, the EU, al EU alone can, cannot be responsible for the whole um, challenges which are related to green transition. Um, and as you, of course, know, a lot of developing countries or middle-income countries um, still are on a development path. So they still have to overcome poverty, they have to overcome um, basic needs for their societies, and uh, of course they have to make the cost-benefit analysis, how can we overcome it while transforming in a green way. And um, these are the main challenges now, because challenges in the global south are multi-challenges, multi so to say, um, that we do not face here. And I think we always have to be aware of that, um, not to make the mistake that trying to promote templates or trying to promote policies to be adapted in different countries which have completely different challenges. So we should be humble, but on the same time share experiences uh, on uh, specific technologies or on, 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 on lessons learned on, from our green transformation. Um, although, of course, we are also not a role model. So I think that's also very important to keep in mind that um, the EU has very different countries with very different success or non-success success stories. So um, this is just to add that we all need to be very humble in our efforts to cooperate and to, to offer partnerships from which the EU also can learn. As we see, for example, a lot of countries like Iraq or who live, who live or who are situated in dry areas, they have much more... Um, experience with adaptation because of water shortage. So I think we can also learn a lot from countries in the global south on adaptation, on green transformation. Um, so this is always, I think, um, a lesson learned from both sides, which, which we should be aware of. If, if I may, I would like to come on this. You, you speak about multi-challenging. I would add that there's also an interconnectivity. Mm -hmm also of good opportunities, as you've just mentioned it in the end. Um, I, I remember for several years I've, I've lived in Indonesia. And Indonesia, I mean, takes a very important role currently also in, in Sharm el-Sheikh, is also a member of the G20. I think it's a perfect example on, um, on how this partnership could look like. Because Indonesia is one of these emerging countries, a former tiger state, uh, became like 20 years ago a member of this very influential group of, of 20. Um, Indonesia, together with, with only two, three other countries, um, is responsible for the majority of rainforest worldwide. And there is also an economic dimension here that this rainforest is protected and not transformed into palm oil industries, uh, as I've seen it on, on Sumatra dramatically. I mean, everybody who has lived in, in Singapore knows about the hazard coming either from Malaysia's uh, oil a palm, a palm oil um, plantations are from, from the Indonesian side. So it's, it's a horrible situation. Flooding is a, is a daily experience. If you, if you live in Jakarta, the first thing, if you look for housing, is how, how horrible is the flooding here? Because it's, it's, I mean, present everywhere. They will move their capital in the, in the upcoming uh, decade. Um, but, uh, I mean, providing them also with economic incentives show how, I mean, also from a creative point of view, climate cooperation can look like. You've mentioned Iraq. I mean, the Middle East is one of the regions that suffers most of, of water scarcity. Um, and countries there really do not like to cooperate, as, as we currently see, I mean, in different parts, in the Mashak as well as in, in, in the Maghreb uh, region. But uh, energy security, food security, um, water scarcity, are, I mean, common objectives, common threats for these for these nations. And it, I think, also provides from time to time create cooperation opportunities, even between states that formally do not want to talk to each other. Um, and I think this is something that we take, or should take more into consideration to see that there is South-South dialogue taking place, but that there are also incentives. I mean, take... The European history, yeah, we come from a coal and steel community uh, history. This is, I mean, maybe not a role model, but something that could also work in other regions in the world in order to provide them with a concrete tool to find cooperation. And then we have 
maybe on a, on a second level, the positive benefit that it also helps saving the environment. Just a small example from my life. Um, as you mentioned also your experience, I experience my kids in daily life and I see how important it is to provide them with tools um, to understand how to be um, independent and understand as I the connections between uh, different layers. So we go to the woods and we look how to ensure that I can eat, you know, if there is something happening. Sorry, I'm from Czech Republic, so we are used to, to look at the survival <laughs> uh, momentums, especially in early childhood. So uh, still under the other system, we had like special training about how to survive in, uh, in such uh, extreme situations. And it, uh, you know, provide me with tools to understand what I can do, how I can adapt to a really quickly changing environment. And I think here I would underline the role of education, uh, that really we should maybe also reform the education system and reflecting the changes because, because the education in some countries are still just really, um, how to say, not reflecting, not creative enough. So I, I think this should be also focused how we prepare the next generations for the changing situation environment and really provide them with tools that they understand how to react and as I said, not continue it all waves which won't work in the future. So this is just to bring my uh, concrete example. And also I would like to ask you at the end about some good practice or do you have any, any do you see any light in the tunnel in a way of how humans are already now reacting to the climate change, some success stories, something where you see, yeah, this this was taken as an opportunity and something is changing. You mentioned Indonesia and maybe they are now also more focused on adaptation measures. But um, as you travel a lot, can you bring us some positive examples how people or communities are reacting and having success with what they did? Mm. I mean, on, on a very personal level, I can just subscribe to, to what you've just described. I see the next generation coming up um, uh, who are already much more aware, much more educated. They teach us already now uh, how to deal with the situation, how to how to do better. I mean, this is something that I that I see on a personal level uh, on a daily basis. Mm, um, a beautiful experience that I've that I've made was, in fact, in the Middle East, and this is why I came up with this uh, example. Uh, I I um, worked together with um, different partners from from Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. Uh, in a different political and and, and and professional context, and these um, these initiatives found a common ground where they where they seen a common threat, which is water scarcity and energy supply, and they developed the idea that um, there could be a positive interconnectivity. Um, desalinated water from the Mediterranean coast in exchange for renewables could be possible even without peace agreements. And I think this is something where creativity can lead us to a better future. And I think we need to see more. We need to see more champions coming up with something proactively. Um, and I think this then in the end also leads to multitasking, uh, a multi-stakeholder perspective, um, because it's not only the state who has to come with the initiative. The civil society brings together a lot of knowledge and experience. The business sector can do so as well. And all of this, I think, should work hand in hand and not form different bubbles that are not connected enough.